The history of mankind reaches back thousands of years. China, washed by the waters of the Yellow River and the Yangtze, is no exception. In the north of this vast land, this empire of a thousand faces, men forged a nation. They tamed rivers and cultivated a land as smooth as silk. They raised the art of casting metals so high they could discourse with the gods. For these Chinese of the north, hardy and brave, the horizon was a potent symbol. From the horizon came the enemy. But the horizon also beckoned them to an ever greater empire. By unifying an immense territory, an emperor built a nation in his own image. His laws and his philosophy forged a heritage, and yet, where it all began, there was only earth and water. He takes the sky as his road, the earth as his chariot, the four seasons as his horses. He has the rain to clear his path, the wind to sweep away the dust. He makes the lightning his whip and the thunder his wheels. He soars above the clouds floating in the sky. He is the magnificent Feng Yi, god of the Yellow River. This endless yellow earth has traveled a long way. It is loose, fertile sedimentary dust carried by the wind from the deserts of Central Asia. Entire villages depend on it for their food. In winter, when the wind tries to rip this natural treasure from the hillsides, the peasants try to stabilize the soil, for the loose is as fine as it is soft and the slightest gust forces it to continue a journey that it started a long time ago. Man settled here over 10,000 years ago. It's thanks to this yellow earth that civilization was born in China. It was everything the primeval soil and the primary material for many innovations. No other civilization is so totally associated with the earth from which it was born. In stormy weather, the water that streams from the northern plateaus dissolves the Lurs. That is how this ancient alluvium gave its name to one of the world's greatest rivers, the Yellow River. China covers over 10 million square kilometers between the Yellow River and the Yangtze. It was there that Chinese civilization was born. Le feu jaune, il a joué un rôle absolument fondamental. C'est un il a été en fait le berceau de la civilisation en Chine du Nord au même titre que le Yangtze Tiang l'a été pour la Chine du Sud. C'est lui qui a façonné tout le paysage de cette région, cette Chine du Leus, la terre jaune caractéristique de la Chine et auquel les Chinois s'identifient. C'est le symbole de, de la Chine idé, idéale dans ce qu'elle a de, 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 plus, de plus chinois. Et ça a été aussi bien sûr la terre sur laquelle la, les premiers agriculteurs se sont, se sont installés puisque ce lieu c'est une terre extrêmement fertile et c'est euh, au bord du fleuve jaune et de ses affluents que se sont installés les premiers villages d'agriculteurs.
Aujourd'hui, ce paysage de, de la Chine du Nord, irrigué par le fleuve jaune, ressemble à une grande plaine semi-désertique, euh, jaune, bordée de terrasses de Leus. Mais euh, aux alentours de, de 6600, 4000 euh, avant notre ère, il faut euh, imaginer au contraire une vaste forêt de feuillus euh, qui couvrait euh, à peu près toute la Chine du Nord jusqu'à la limite de la, de la Mongolie. From the time the first human communities settled here, they cleared the forests on these plateaus. This deforestation destroyed several thousand square kilometers of woodland. 3,000 years ago, trees and shrubs formed 80% of the region's landscape. Today, they account for only 5%. This is what the high plateaus looked like 5,000 years ago. Here in Huangling, the primeval forest was preserved by imperial decree. It is still forbidden to cut down these trees. For today's Chinese, this is a magical spot. It preserves the memory of the past. According to legend, Trees were planted here by emperors from the first great dynasty, the Shang, more than 3,500 years ago. By sinking their roots in the Lus, these plantations stabilized the water table and allowed the springs to remain plentiful, which is unusual on the high plateaus. The splendor of the first dynasties rested on wood. The civilization drew its vital force from wood. Its artists perfected their techniques thanks to wood. And it was from wood that the Shang built the first monumental tombs of their rulers. In 1928, a few kilometers from the city of Anyang in Henan province, archaeological expeditions made a series of discoveries that would revolutionize our knowledge of ancient China. For the first time, Sumptuous tombs proved the power of the state in northern China 1,600 years before Christ. The digs quickly spread to cover the whole vast region. After the excavations, the sites around Anyang were carefully filled up. Professor Tung knows the exact location of one of the first tombs unearthed on the plain. This is the 1550 Hong 现在这个照片是从南往西北拍的这个墓我们这么看这个墓是从这个方向过去这是北墓道大概就在那个位置北墓道长的二十二米六将近二十三米墓的深度呢从那下去是十三米现在因为地表有一米深现在是十四米了当
they had discovered a huge cruciform tomb. The longer arms stretched north-south for 82 meters, and the shorter ran east-west for 53. Building the monument must have been a colossal enterprise, requiring a solid grasp of abstract geometry. The longest access ramp, sloping gently down to the heart of the tomb, made it easy to transport the king's body inside. In the center of the tomb was the king's final resting place. This is where his sarcophagus was laid, together with that of the wife he had chosen to accompany him on his final journey. Around the royal remains, the archaeologists found hundreds of bronze objects, vases, pottery items, and various utensils of jade. These were intended to serve the deceased in the afterlife, though some of the jade items were used to put victims to death during human sacrifices. In the past 70 years, archaeologists have unearthed 11 tombs built on the same plan. Almost all had been robbed, but most still held some fabulous treasures. By returning deep into the earth, the first kings were merging with the matrix of their universe, the soil in which their traditions and their art of living were rooted. Three thousand six hundred years ago, near the city of Qinzhou, fields of millet, wheat and soy covered the banks of the Yellow River. Further north, the traveller entered barbarian lands populated by pastoral nomads, who were trading partners of the Yellow Earth peasants. But the Yellow Earth is more than a source of abundant crops. It bears the imprint of China's past. Its many qualities were quickly exploited by craftsmen and builders. Le le ça a conditionné l'évolution de la de la civilisation chinoise à plusieurs égards. Tout d'abord, c'est une terre fertile, donc euh, c'est sur le le que se sont développées euh, les cultures du millet, euh, puisque la Chine du Nord c'est la culture du millet par par opposition à la Chine du Sud, verdoyante, plus humide, qui est la Chine du du riz. Et puis le 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 ce n'est pas seulement l'agriculture, hein, c'est aussi la matière première euh, qui domine tout le paysage et dont pouvait donc peuvent disposer les habitants, les paysans de la région, aujourd'hui comme, comme hier. C'est le matériau qui a servi dans l'architecture chinoise depuis l'origine. Euh, C'est avec le leu, parfois mêlé d'argile, que l'on construit les maisons, euh, les maisons des paysans, mais aussi les palais des rois euh, ou les enceintes euh, des, villes, des premières villes fortifiées. C'est le, avec le bois la matière première essentielle de l'architecture chinoise. 3,600 years ago, Chinese peasants made a discovery. Packed down and compressed, the fine loose particles formed a mass as solid as stone. That was providential, because at nightfall, elephants, rhinos and other wild animals would come out of the forests to devastate crops and slaughter cattle. To this day, farmers on the high plateaus of northern China use this method to build the walls surrounding their fields. The earth is painstakingly packed inside a wooden frame. It dries as hard as brick.
This construction technique, which the Chinese call banju, wasn't used only for domestic structures. These earth walls in the modern city of Chengzhou on the banks of the Yellow River are over 3,000 years old. They seem impervious to time and weather. It is estimated that every layer of lurs in these walls was 10 centimeters thick. To build some sections, the masons laid over a hundred layers. It's difficult to imagine the patience and skill required to build this huge structure. The wall is seven kilometers long, nine meters high, and 20 meters wide. This titanic fortification protected the heart of the royal city, capital of the Shan. To build it, 10,000 workers labored in continuous shifts every day for 18 years. It demonstrates the power and sophistication of a civilization that already had a pictographic writing system and highly developed methods of foretelling the future. It was also making its first astronomical observations. In the course of their 500-year reign, the Shang kings laid the basis of a conquering state. The Ying Shu Museum houses the sacred relics of a dynasty whose entire authority was symbolized in the art of working bronze. These bronze vases testify to past greatness. They are the messengers of a people who quickly learned how to take advantage of the tin and copper deposits around the Yellow River. No other ancient civilization reached the level of perfection attained by Shang craftsmen. In casting these ceremonial vases, they were simultaneously serving their gods and their king. The Shang kings commissioned the vases to reinforce their power and reaffirm their relationship with the heavens. The Tao Ti, complex arabesques that decorate the vessels, reveal the relationship the Shang had with their gods. The intricate patterns and angular projections form the stylized face of their deities, simultaneously feared and worshipped. To tame their universe and transform it to their own image, the Shang refined alloys. Metalwork was at the heart of their material and spiritual development. La métallurgie marque une étape extrêmement importante dans le développement de la, de la civilisation puisque bon, avec le bronze apparaît euh, l'âge du bronze, l'écriture, la, la formation d'un état centralisé, les premières villes issues de, du, du, du néolithique, euh, tout un ensemble de, de constructions, une structure sociale qui marque une étape absolument déterminante dans, dans la civilisation chinoise. Et c'est aussi euh, à travers la maîtrise de la métallurgie que les, les, les souverains chinois vont euh, acquérir la force euh, et le, le pouvoir qui va leur permettre d'étendre leur territoire, euh, voire d'entrer en conflit les uns avec les autres et euh, d'étendre leur foyer de civilisation. Bien sûr, cette civilisation du bronze s'est installée là, euh, où se, à proximité de, de mines, mines de cuivre, mines d'étain, qui servaient donc à, à fabriquer cet alliage, mais aussi euh, dans des endroits où le leus pouvait être utilisé pour la fabrication des moules qui servaient à la, à la coulée de ces grands récipients euh, en bronze. Euh, il fallait aussi la présence d'eau et de bois, justement, 
pour que cette métallurgie puisse se développer. Et on se, si l'on regarde la carte, on s'aperçoit que justement ces premiers foyers de la, de la civilisation du bronze correspondent aux zones riches en, en minerais, en eau et en matières premières. Japanese scientists have rediscovered the methods of the Shang sculptors. Using Shang techniques and materials, they have revived an art that is 3,600 years old. They found the secret of making the bronze vases known as Ding and Lei, which stand almost a meter high and weigh over 120 kilos. The secret was in the lurse that's used to make the huge molds. Master Mitsuru Kashi has recreated the art of transforming lurse into clay. Once the lurse is mixed with water and kneaded, it accepts the exact imprint of the original molding. The plates fit to the millimeter. To put it all together requires hours of patient work. Only the fine, silky, yellow earth of the high plateaus permitted such exquisite precision. Delicate arabesques covered each piece like a negative imprint of the cosmology of northern China. The fertile soil that allowed civilization to take root and grow on the banks of the Yellow River also served art and religion. In this bronze lei, the ruler would offer wine to the gods, symbolizing his union with the celestial forces whose favor he was trying to win. Today, Japanese craftsmen are trying to revive this art. The mold is fired for eight hours. Then the sculptors pour in molten metal heated to over a thousand degrees centigrade. Only yellow earth molds can tolerate such a high temperature without cracking. When the metal is poured, the inside of the mold becomes as hard as rock, imprinting every detail on the metal. The craftsmen have to use chisels on the mold to get the vase out. The mold is used only once. Each piece was unique and priceless. It transmitted the message of the gods. When they saw it shining in the sun, worshippers were subdued and apprehensive. For the face of the god glowed with a thousand flames that proved his presence. During lengthy rituals, the cavernous sound that came from the vase refocused worshippers' attention. In the same period, priests developed complex methods of divination by engraving occult signs on bones. Messages to the gods were everywhere, and people and sovereigns alike prayed for their help.
Le bronze, tout d'abord, en tant que matériau, c'est le matériau de, de l'élite. C'est le, le, le symbole du pouvoir et du rituel. Donc il est un reflet du, de, de la société euh, extrêmement important. Euh, le bronze, à, à l'époque des, des Shang ou l'époque d'Anyang, leur, de, leur dernière capitale, euh, est réservé à la fabrication des armes ou des bronzes rituels euh, qui étaient utilisés dans le cadre du culte des ancêtres. The dragon stares into eternity. This vase, called Sigon by believers, contained wine offerings made to the gods during lavish ceremonies. The ruler regularly summoned dancers and priests to huge banquets in honor of the gods. There, the bronze became an intermediary between him and the divine. This exclusive relationship determined the fate of the kingdom. But only the prince could hear the voices that told him which path was correct and whether the rains would be propitious for the harvest. As part of the ritual, Dishes and wines were brought from the four corners of the kingdom. The king offered them to the gods, then ate the sacrificial food to reinforce his spiritual power. The people watched through incense smoke as hundreds of dancers honored the gods and their king. The bronze vessels from Shang tombs contain all the magic of these religious ceremonies. They are also witnesses to a vanished world. The fauna from the high plateau forests feature in slow procession, rhinos, elephants. So do mythical monsters, their gaping mouths devouring humans. The bronzes were worshipped by the Shang, but they also reflect their fears, for dark clouds often overshadowed their lives. The Shang knew that war was part of daily life. And bronze wasn't used only for ritual objects. L'art de la guerre va jouer un, un rôle très important à l'époque des, des Shang, à l'âge du bronze. Et le bronze, donc ce matériau noble par excellence, va être utilisé aussi pour fabriquer des armes. Euh, des armes et ce qui touche au domaine de la guerre, puisqu'il sera utilisé aussi pour fabriquer les chars. Euh, le char étant aussi un symbole de pouvoir, de royauté. When archaeologists first excavated ancient Chinese cities, they were surprised to discover thousands of molds in clay or stone for arrowheads, spearheads, molds that allowed the mass production of an entire arsenal. The bronze culture was abandoning ceremonies to honor the gods. Religious ritual was giving way to war. These near industrial production methods allowed various kingdoms to raise huge armies. Greed, lust for power, ancient hatreds, led to horrific wars. China sank into a permanent state of war that would last a thousand years. Three thousand years ago, the Shang Empire was attacked by its Zhou neighbors and collapsed. The city of Anyang was sacked. The great kingdoms were now split into tiny, independent, rival states. And yet, in this chaos, rival courts competed in creativity. Out of the void, new representations of the universe emerged. It was the age of Confucianism and Taoism. On vases, human beings replaced the gods. Women collect mulberries, 
Musicians play their instruments, women dance while men prepare for war. From 650 BC, chronic instability turned into terror. Ruthless adventurers replaced aristocratic warriors. Skirmishes gave way to full-scale battles. Cities burned and blood flowed. The excavation of a battlefield near the city of Yingshu revealed the fate of the vanquished. It unearthed 1,500 graves with five skeletons in each one. 7,500 men had been beheaded. The winner of the battle wanted to prevent their return from the next world. For 400 years, life in China was dominated by executions and deportations. The mountains of southern China, a huge contrast with the bare plateaus of the Yellow River Valley. The Chang people here retain a folk memory of the ancient fighting, for they were among its victims. They were forced to flee from Henan to Sichuan, a trek of several thousand kilometers to seek a refuge in the mountains. <whistles> to quell their fear of a surprise attack, the Chung built high stone towers that guard the mountain passes to this day. Thousands of years after the Exodus, shamans still sing the tragic epic. Their songs still echo in the mountains, relaying the memory of a traumatized people. For 600 years, the Qing, the people of the most formidable warrior kingdom, tested their valor against the barbarians on their western borders. But from 230 BC, thanks to their mastery of iron, they conquered all their neighboring states. So a new state, feudal, authoritarian, and centralized, was born. China united under one man, Shi Huangdi the first emperor of China. The horseman is not of this world. He feeds freely on pink mists. His body dissolves as his spirit freezes. 
His word speaks the silence of the immortal. Enemy of vulgarity, he flees the multitude. Friend of the solitary, he seeks the mountain. If sometimes the sphinx's wings are torn, no one can tame the spirit of the dragon. China under Mao was a closed society. Information was closely guarded. But on the 29th of March, 1974, sensational news flashed around the world. While plowing his field in the Guangzhou Valley, not far from the tomb of Shi Huangdi, a peasant had uncovered the most fabulous treasure since that of Tutankhamun. The area was well known to experts, who could miss this earth pyramid covering more than a hectare. But the site had never been explored, and legend said that the tomb concealed treasure. To the east of the tomb, the plough had uncovered life-sized human figures. First one, then two, then ten. The ghost of the Emperor Shi Huangdi was everywhere. He had ordered this vast mausoleum built to his own glory. But who was he, really? Sir Huangdi is a personage extraordinary who is become a myth to himself. We le him through the writings of Sima Tian, the great historian Chinese of the time, who paints a portrait physical and moral. Bon, déjà, au physique, c'est un personnage très particulier, avec un nez proéminent, des yeux larges, une poitrine d'oiseau de proie, une voix de chacal. Euh, enfin, c'est un personnage tyrannique qui en a euh, les, les traits, les signes extérieurs. Il est décrit aussi comme euh, un, un dévoreur d'hommes, euh, avaleur de tout contradicteur. Bon, on verra d'ailleurs que quiconque s'opposera à lui euh, mourra de mort violente. C'est ainsi que finiront aussi aussi les anciens euh, livres, les, les, les classiques chinois euh, qui n'entraient ne, pas dans ces vues seront brûlés lors d'un grand autodafé. C'est aussi euh, un mégalomane d'une certaine façon, quelqu'un qui se veut au centre du monde. After a few days of digging, the archaeologists had to acknowledge the obvious. Awaiting them was an entire army in battle order. Shi Huangdi had not embarked alone on his last journey. Apart from the slaves sacrificed to serve him in the afterlife, he was accompanied by a terracotta army of 8,000 infantrymen, plus horses. Spearmen, archers, charioteers and officers were keeping watch for all eternity. Each figure was different. Every face had individual features. The Emperor's personal guard seemed to have been frozen for 2,000 years, awaiting orders to move into battle. The archaeologists could only wonder, what else might the Emperor's tomb contain? The tyrant's megalomania was frightening, and yet there was one thing he feared. Xin Shi Huangdi a toujours été obsédé par la mort. Euh, il a envoyé, par exemple, de, des émissaires auprès des immortels euh, censés euh, posséder l'élixir d'immortalité, par exemple. Mais aussi, dès le début de son règne, euh, il a euh, convoqué des travailleurs forcés, plus de 700 000 personnes, euh, à la construction de son futur tombeau, euh, qui, euh, pour vous donner une idée, qui en volume est à un volume supérieur à celui de la plus grande pyramide d'Égypte. Le tombeau lui-même n'a pas encore été ouvert. On en connaît la, la, la description toujours par cet historien chinois qui en fait un récit qui fait, qui fait rêver. Euh, ce tombeau est conçu comme un immense palais souterrain, mais aussi un, une copie, un microcosme du, du monde. Euh, on y aurait, Montin Shorwangdi aurait voulu qu'il soit représenté euh, le ciel, il y aurait eu une voûte avec une représentation des étoiles du, du, du monde céleste, mais aussi euh, les 100 rivières euh, faites en mercure, des systèmes de, un mobilier euh, d'une richesse extraordinaire, des systèmes de protection euh, très sophistiqués avec des arbalètes, des flèches automatiques qui seraient déclenchées à la moindre tentative d'effraction. De, Et ce, ce mausolée 
n'a pas encore été fouillé. Euh, des sondages ont montré qu'il y avait une teneur en mercure très importante à proximité, mais pour l'instant, bon, peut-être pour garder la magie de cette, <rire> de cette description, euh, seul les, le parc funéraire et les fosses qui sont autour ont été fouillés. Mais le, le tombeau lui-même garde encore tout son mystère. In August 1998, archaeologists made a new discovery at the foot of the mausoleum. Shi Huangdi left nothing to chance. Beside his troops lay an armory for their use. The archaeologists expected to find only a few spears and arrowheads. They discovered an entire arsenal. As well as weapons, there was armor of exceptional quality. No one had ever seen anything like it. It was made of stone. You是完全不一样的，这是一件铠甲的这么一个部位，这么一个部位。就是每个甲片呢，它就经过非常仔细的打磨。根据我们做的实验呢，就用我们现在所想象的这些工具加工起来的话呢，呃，做衣领铠
跨越河谷，就是从我们这个地方，从我们这个地方一直延伸过去，到达这个小山的下边，远处那个小山的下边，整个大坝全长是两千六百五十米。So legend proves to be true. Shi Huangdi tamed the rivers and built canals. To build this dam, thousands of people must have been mobilized. It must have stretched over two and a half kilometers, and it must have risen tens of meters high. The compressed earth dam wall created a lake whose waters irrigated the whole plain. It was the quality of the Lurse as well as the use of iron tools that made it possible to build this gigantic monument. The soil of the first Chinese peasants who lived many centuries before Shi Huangdi was still used in building his imperial monuments. Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor, established a thousand-year civilization based on an autocratic and theocratic state. It would last till the middle of the 20th century. But what legacy did Shi Huangdi pass on to his successors? Ce premier empereur bon, a d'abord créé un nouvel ordre après le chaos, qu'il a créé aussi toute la structure administrative de ce qui qu allait devenir la Chine euh, par la suite, avec une division en préfecture, en district, l'unification des systèmes d'écriture, euh, des routes, une unification des poids, des mesures. Donc, qu'ont été mis en place, en fait, tous les éléments fondateurs d'une nouvelle phase de, de civilisation, qui a été reprise ensuite par... Euh, les, les Han, la dynastie suivante, et puis euh, par d'autres dynasties, mais qu'on a là en germe, en tout cas, euh, les principaux fondements de cette civilisation chinoise de la Chine d'aujourd'hui. From then on, China was unified from north to south, from the green mountains of Sichuan to the arid plateaus of the north. And a good part of China's epic history was written thanks to its yellow earth. Today, China has over a billion people, and some modern Chinese have returned to the yellow mountains of the north to plant trees. Entire villages regularly plant apricot trees on the high plateaus because they can survive the region's harsh weather. In the bitter cold, with fierce winds trying to blow away their yellow earth, these men, women and children are fighting to return this barren landscape to what it was thousands of years ago. Their tools are still primitive, but a few shovels are enough, for the power of the people lies above all in their common will. And who knows? Maybe one day these mountains will be covered in blossoming trees. Four thousand years have passed. Four thousand years of development, war, dictatorship, and revolution. Chinese civilization today is at once removed from and close to its past. Even with its face set resolutely toward the future, China still encounters the memory of ancient times every step of the way. But China's strength lies in its ability to unite to overcome the obstacles. 
4,000 years of turbulent history have taught the Chinese to close ranks in the face of adversity. It's as if the magic of time has allowed an entire people to acquire the qualities of the earth in which their roots are planted. The ageless, yellow earth.